This is Untapped with M.E. and I am M.E. On this podcast, I love to do my two favorite things, tell true and crazy stories about my life in this small town of Nacogdoches, Texas, and drink beer. Yes, lovely, delicious beer. What are we drinking today? We are drinking in Tropic. Ta-da! I was down on Austin Street in Houston at a place called the Market Bar and I found out about Entropic. So, gonna pour myself some here. We'll try it right now. Oh yeah, that's good. That's real good. You know, sometimes a beer tastes better in your memory when you are doing something that you really enjoy when you have that beer. So when I had this beer, for the first time, I had it with a really great salad and a really great friend. And so, yeah, great memories then for Entropic. Get you some. Okay, I'm going to drink this beer while I tell you a story. We are continuing the story of Christian Philip James Oliver. This next part we're going to call The Brothers. Into the court of Judge Jack Pierce come the two Rubel Kaba brothers to tell what really happened out there on Camp Tonkawa Road that day in 1998. We know that we got an older man lying face up in his front yard. He is shot in the face. He is beat in the face. His name is Joe Collins. But good Lord, why? Lani Rubacaba is just 16 years old when the crime occurs. Benny Rubacaba is 15, y'all. Regardless, the state is playing hardball. They charge them both with capital murder. They certify those boys as adults. The state can't execute them for capital murder because they are minors, but they can send them away for life. 15 years old and done, y'all. Worse, they would be sentenced to an adult facilite. These boys would be locked up with some of the worst criminals out there, y'all. The state has a plan. When I say the state, I'm talking about the prosecution representing the state of Texas. That would be two men, Tim James and Mac Cobb. Tim James is our reigning local Nacogdoches DA. His former gigs include the Houston Police Department, the Organized Crime Unit for the Texas Attorney General, and the Organized Crime Liaison in Kosovo for the U.S. State Department. Okay, this guy is fierce. <laughs> and Mac Cobb is an Assistant Attorney General in Texas who specializes in capital murder. So James and Cobb are going to work those boys, and they know what they're doing. The state offers each boy a plea deal. Tell their story to a jury and get a light sentence. Then he would get five and Lonnie would get 10. That is Christmas for these boys, y'all. But they are going to have to face the man whose life is on the line, Christian Oliver. They are going to pin the crime on him. If he is acquitted and gets out, what would stop him from finding those boys and murdering them too? So this is crazy poo poo scary for young Lonnie and Benny. Mama Rubacaba, she's sitting in the courtroom to be sure that they find their courage. <laughs> While they testify, she sits in the courtroom across from them and she nods her head in encouragement. Well, uh, Judge Pierce has to tell her to stop that. You can't do that. But they do tell their stories and I'm going to tell you what they have to say. All right, let's have a little beer before we begin. Okay, it's about 6 p.m. on March 17th, 1998. It is spring break for the boys. They are spending their day riding around the country in Cushing, that's in Nacogdoches County. They're out there among all those majestic pine trees. They are in Christian Oliver's truck. His girlfriend, Sonia Reed, is with them too. They all say that they were not smoking pot, the truck still smells like pot when it is found the next day. There are zigzag papers on the floorboard. They were all probably smoking pot. How does this strange group know each other? 
two Hispanic teenagers from Nacogdoches County, a 25-year-old white woman, and a 20-year-old black man from Waco, Texas. Stay with me and I will tell you that crazy poo-poo story. Christian compulsively looks for a place to rob. Osborne's Liquor and Gas, Mall Grocery, Larry's Country Boy Store. They wait one hour across the street from the mall store for the people to close. Christian says he and Sonia, they need the money to get back to Waco. One boy objects and the other says nothing, so they don't rob those doors. They decide instead to head out to see one of Sonia's friends. Sonia wants to see if she has some pot. Maybe she will loan them some money for the ride back to Waco too. The friend lives off of Camp Tonkawa Road. So they head down Camp Tonkawa Road. Christian sees a small house tucked beneath some trees. He suspects no one is home. He decides to rob this house. Christian parks the truck down the road and goes up to the door. He calls out, hello? He hears nothing but the yips of a little dog. He sees a padlock on the front door. He sees a padlock on the back door too. He goes back to the truck to get three things. Bolt cutters, his pistol, and one of the boys. Lonnie and Christian walk back to the house. They break the padlock. Room by room, drawer by drawer, they take apart that house. They take the rods and reels by the front door. They stack a rifle, a TV, some guns, some bows, and a VCR in the living room. They're going to take it all back to the truck. This is the home of Joe Collins. It is now close to 7.30 p.m. It is dark. Suddenly, they see the headlights of a car flash into the windows. Joe Collins is home. Joe sees the broken padlock. The lights are on. The TV is off. He knows he left that TV on. He sees his stuff stacked in the den. He knows what's up. He sees that his trusted old 3030 rifle has been thrown on the couch. He grabs it. Lonnie and Christian have run to the back of the house to find an exit. But the back door is blocked by a bed. The next thing they hear is, Mother Ockers! Lonnie never sees the rifle. He never sees Joe Collins. He just sees the door to the room he is in blow open. He slumps to the floor. He's been hit. One bullet has gone through the left and entered into the right. Joe Collins steps out of the room to reload. Kristen follows. Lonnie hears Joe reloading that rifle. A 3030 is an old timey gun with a lever action. He knows that sound. Then he hears shots and then more shots again. Kristen runs back in for Lonnie. He is bleeding out in that leg. He takes off Lonnie's belt. He ties it around his leg to make a tourniquet. Now he's got to get him out of the house, but Lonnie is a very big boy, about 260. Christian wraps his arm around him, and with the other arm, he grabs a 22 rifle leaning up against the bed. He wants that. Together, they hobble out of the house. As they step off of the porch, there is an obstruction at the foot of the steps. They will have to step over it. It is the body of Joe Collins. He is lying face up. If Joe Collins could see, he would be looking up into that sky to see those pine trees on the land that he loved. But Joe can't see anything. He is dead. Side by side with him is his 30-30. The last bullet jammed in the chamber. Christian can't take Lonnie any further than the drive. He drops him there. He frantically calls out for Sonia, bring the truck around. Benny is in the passenger side. He sees his big brother bleeding on the drive. He hops out and runs to him. Lonnie is trying to resecure the tourniquet with his own belt. He is starting to recognize the full magnitude of that injury. He says, I was very scared. I had blood all over my pants. I started thinking, I might not make it to the hospital. 
Benny is lifting Lonnie off of the drive when he hears a loud smacking sound. They both look over their shoulders to see Christian standing over the helpless body of Joe Collins. Christian has picked up that 3030. He holds it by its barrel and he swings into the face of Joe Collins like he was swinging a golf club. That is a quote. To Christian, that 3030 isn't anything but an old piece of wood and some steel. He is going to take that 22, but not this old gun. But that is the gun that means the most to the Collins family. Joe's son Alvin says that that gun was special. That's my daddy's 3030. He's had it for a long time. I've hunted with it, and well, it's just been in the family forever since I was little. I shot my first deer with it at the house. Joe Collins kept that gun right inside the front door. It was right at the ready to protect him and his. That old gun nearly did just that today, but instead it is used against him. Benny gets Lonnie to the back seat of the truck. He doesn't notice, but his belt used as that tourniquet slips off and onto the drive. Benny looks over his shoulder again. This is what he sees. Christian stops swinging. He looks away and then he swings again. This time he swings like he is chopping wood. Benny gets in the bed of the truck because Lonnie is stretched out in the back seat. Christian speeds away like a madman and lands in a ditch. Here they are trying to make a fast getaway and now they're stuck. They are not going anywhere. Benny gets out and literally this boy pushes the truck out of the ditch. Remember, he is our football player. Sonia tells Christian to let her drive. So he gets in the back of the truck with Benny because the passenger seat is full of Lonnie's blood. He brings that 22 rifle he took, but while they speed to the hospital, he changes his mind. They don't need no evidence in that truck. He throws it out into the woods off Highway 59. Down the road they go. Lonnie nearly loses that leg, y'all. He has surgery that night and he has it again two days later in Galveston. But the thing that first helped save Lonnie's leg is the thing that nearly cost him his freedom. On the drive of Joe Collins, police find his bloody belt. Let's have a little refresher here. We're gonna move on to our next part. It's gonna get good, y'all, because this part is called Aunt Sonia. Sonia Fawn Reed is facing the very end of her life. She's charged with capital murder she could spend the rest of her life in prison. Or worse, she could be sentenced to death. All she has to do to save herself is testify against her boyfriend, Christian Oliver. If she will do that, she will only have to serve 10 years. But Sonia Fawn Reed is not taking that plea deal. Mm -mm. She does not intend to spend any time in prison. There's a reason why she needs to be home real badly right away. See, when Sonia Fawn Reed is sitting in that truck being a lookout, waiting to drive her lover away, there is something you don't know. She is three months pregnant, y'all, and Christian is the baby daddy. Everybody finds that out when the police arrest her in the motel hallway. She immediately faints. She reveals her situation to the police. The police send her to the hospital for an ultrasound to be sure all is well. Well, everything is fine with the baby. Sonia is oddly giddy with excitement. She can't wait to be a mommy. This woman does not understand the gravité of the reality before her. She says no thank you to the state's offer. She will bet her life on a trial by a jury. That is a very poor gamble, y'all. In September of 1999, Sonia Fawn Reed comes to Judge Pierce's 145th District Court for her trial. Benny and Lonnie are also coming to the trial. They are there to testify against her. And now we will find out how these four very different people wind up together that day. The connection is Sonia Reed. Benny and Lonnie have known Sonia Reed for three years. She is in fact their mother's friend. Their mother, and Sonia Reed worked together at the East Texas Blood Center in Nacogdoches. Sonia has spent a lot of time at their home in Cushing. 
She is so close to them that those boys call her Aunt Sonia. When she first meets those boys, they are 13 and 12. They are children. About a week before the murder, Aunt Sonia comes down to visit the Rubalcaba family. She brings her boyfriend, Christian. They live together in Waco. She tells the boys to call him Kit. On Friday, Aunt Sonia and Kit pick up the boys early from school. Benny is in the ninth grade. He goes back later for football practice and play rehearsal, things that kids do. On Saturday, Aunt Sonia lets the boys play with Kit's guns, a 38 special and a 380. On Sunday, Aunt Sonia lets one of Lonnie's friends ride with them to a little country store in a place called Sackle. He is 14 years old. It is 4 a.m. They are not there to buy a soda, y'all. Kit runs in to make a robbery. While he does so, Sonia says something to that little friend. She gets real serious and she says, if you tell on my father's baby, I'll kill you. On Tuesday, the day of the murder, Aunt Sonia and Kit take the boys for a drive among all those lovely pine trees. Aunt Sonia goes into Continental Liquor and buys the boys a half gallon of vodka for the road. Aunt Sonia says nothing to Kit when he asks those boys three times to help rob a convenience store. At Mr. Collins' house, when Kit comes back to the car for the bolt cutters and his pistol, he asks Sonia, who's with me? What he means is, tell me which one of these boys I am going to take into the house. And Aunt Sonia says, take Lonnie with you. Is Aunt Sonia a follower or a facilitator? There are two people who testify on behalf of Sonia Fawn Reed. One is her friend, Missy. She is the friend that the four of them are going to see down Camp Tonkawa Road the day of the murder. Sonia was hoping Missy would have some marijuana for her morning sickness. Missy says that she and Sonia are best friends. Missy describes Sonia as a beautiful person. She says, she's done so much for me. I, I couldn't even explain to you all the things she's done for me. She's always been there for me. I will continue to be there for her forever. The other person who steps up for Sonia is a big surprise, her ex-husband. Sonia and Mr. Reed fell in love when she was just 17. They married when she was 19. They lived right here in Nacogdoches for a bit. But about seven months before the murder, she had an affair. The affair was with a man that looked a lot like her husband. That is because the man was his cousin. She moved to Waco. The cousin flipped out and followed her there. She got a job as a topless cocktail waitress. She moved in with Christian Oliver. And now she has had his baby. Whoo, there's been a whole lot of crazy poo-poo going on. What in the world is Mr. Reed feeling right now? Not what you would think on the witness stand. He is clearly shaken. I, I felt compassion for her. I, can, can I have a cup of water? The charges that she was charged with just didn't seem like her. I, I went to the jail to talk to her, but we weren't planning on just moving back in together. We planned on having some type of relationship and building on that friendship. I, I told her I, I'd always be her friend. Sonia and Mr. Reed once had a beautiful life. They had 50 peach trees. They had a dog and five cats. All that was missing was a baby. Mr. Reed says, we, we always had a dream of having a child together. And well, that didn't happen, but she had a child. And no matter how much you try to bury feelings for someone, they're still there. And I uh, uncovered those feelings that are still there. That child still needs her someday. I write to her and encourage her to try to keep it together so that someday she can take care of her daughter. Mr. Cobb, the prosecutor, then asks Mr. Reed, have you seen that child? Ooh, I bet every person in that courtroom got real quiet to hear that answer. Has he seen the love child of the woman he still loves? Where is that eight month old baby? With Sonia's mother. And yes, he is visiting that child. When Mr. Reed and Sonia meet. Sonia is living at a place called Browngate. It is for girls and foster care. Sonia had parents, but what they could offer was um, insufficient at the time. There were a lot of children, 
There were a lot of stepfathers. There was a lot of poverty. There were abusive relatives. There was an unexpected death of a young brother. Sonia's mother leans in on her fundamentalist Pentecostal faith. Faith was not making Sonia feel any less hopeless. At 16, she moved into Brown Gate. She would never go back home. When she was with Mr. Reed, Sonia did well. She finished two years of college. She got that good job at the East Texas Blood Center. But then the wheels came off the bus. She started telling everyone to call her cat. She started drinking and taking pills. She started dating Christian Oliver. She is 27 when she tells the court that she wants to reclaim what could have been. She says, what my dream has been my whole life is to find peace and quiet. My family, my church family, my baby. And as far as getting out and getting involved with any other men, the only man I want is my husband back. And he would never do anything criminal or get me involved in anything criminal. He's a good man. And I just want a family, some, some plants and animals and in a church and to have peace. But the jury is not seeing Sonia, the animal lover and gardener. No, the jury is seeing the Sonia who helps steal a high dollar boat for her boyfriend, who takes the plates off her husband's boat and puts them on the stolen boat. The jury is seeing the Sonia who swims in the pool at the Tides 2 Motel just eight hours after Mr. Collins is bludgeoned. The jury is seeing the Sonia who says, take Lonnie. The charge against her has been reduced from capital murder to engaging in organized crime. Still, that penalty is up to 99 years. Judge Pierce reads the sentence to Sonia Fawn Reed. It could have been just 10 years, y'all. She is sentenced to 99. There is an important detail about Sonia Fawn Reed that the jury does not know. She had recently lived in an unexpected place. She lived on Camp Tonkawa Road. Her landlord insisted on the rent being paid in cash. The landlord personally picked it up at her door each month. That landlord was Joe Collins. Next time, what will happen to the man accused of swinging that gun like he was swinging a golf club? And why is the world talking about what that Nacogdoches jury brought into the jury room? We will find out in the conclusion of Blood in the Pines. So subscribe and follow and tap into Untapped with M.E.